Today I'm going to be pulling from the article by Susan Enk and Megan Morrissey entitled, If Orange is the New Black, I Must Be Colorblind, Comic Framings of Post-Racism in the Prison Industrial Complex. The Netflix show is Orange is the New Black by Genji Kohan, and it's still on Netflix. I'll share a few clips with you today, but you may want to watch an entire episode or even a season to get in the idea of how the theories we are going to discuss play out on screen. Remember that producers of network television traditionally cater to a white middle class audience, not because they're racist, not because they don't care about rich or poor people. They cater to a white middle class audience because that's who makes up the majority of their viewers. White people have always been the majority in the U.S., and working class people have both a budget and a schedule that aligns well with daily television viewing. The thesis of this article is most clearly stated on page 307, where the authors discuss the main character, Piper. So let's talk about what color blindness is. We've all been there, and some of us have even said it, this phrase, I don't see skin color. There's a great summary of how whiteness works at the beginning of this piece, but in regards to the prison industrial complex, I don't see skin color usually means I don't see the racial disparity in the criminal justice system. So don't forget that one in three black men in the United States will go to prison during their life compared to just one in 17 white men. Don't forget that if you are a white or an Asian child in the United States, your chances of living in poverty are just one in 10 compared to Hispanic or black children whose chances are one in three, actually slightly higher for black kids. Don't forget that black unemployment rates in the United States always hover above white unemployment rates, even if you only look at unemployed people with college degrees. That should be telling to us. Not seeing skin color means that these disparities, which we ought to be ashamed of, by the way, can persist indefinitely. How could we ever see them if we don't see skin color? So on to Kenneth Burke, who focused on framing. Burke is using the word here as a verb describing the process through which we make sense of stories by looking at them through frames. Preconceived ideas of right and wrong, good and bad, winner and loser. We discussed this a bit earlier on in the semester, and I shared a Sigmund Freud passage with y'all concerning the way that comedy works to cushion otherwise nasty or uncomfortable subjects. Burt goes a bit further and discusses the way that we make sense of our lives with stories. In cultural stories about crime and punishment, we want to make sense of the world where terrible things happen. And this is nothing new. Humans have always looked to the stars or to the gods or their ghosts or to ancestors to make sense of things that we haven't figured out how to control. Contemporary storytelling works much the same way. In our stories of crime and punishment, there must be good guys and bad guys, but they don't always remain static. Sometimes redemption happens. Sometimes a bad guy pays his dues and we come to feel sorry for him. Sometimes we feel as if the bad guy has learned a valuable lesson that makes him safe for return to the general public. And sometimes the bad guy just gets what he deserves from a prison cell or from torture, sometimes even by other inmates. And this, Burke thinks, is where we go awry as humans. He thinks that we should focus on framing the criminals in our stories not as monsters, but as tragic, clumsy fools. As comic clowns who tripped on their own feet and stumbled into faulty thinking. So you might consider here how Sam Harris's work intersects. Burke would definitely side with Harris in demolishing current notions of what free will is. He, like Harris, thinks that we are all pre-programmed bots who can only be updated with new knowledge, information, and experience. We can't simply choose to make different decisions as we go. So framing is easy to spot if we take a look at a few cultural examples. There's generally two frames for understanding drug use, for example. One is the dramatic monster and one is the comedic tragic criminal. And we can see how both of these have been played out repeatedly in common narratives. We've talked about some of these earlier in our discussion of the war on drugs. Both of these give viewers a way to understand drug use and yet they are completely different comprehensions. With Cheech and Chong, it's funny, it's safe, it's hilarious. Whereas with some of our PSAs that we've seen, it's monstrous, it's deadly. Similar thing happens with most crimes, and you can think of bank robberies as they're portrayed on film. In the film Going in Style, there is a comedic look at three tragic clowns who viewers feel sorry for, and we even support at times throughout the film. In the blockbuster film The Dark Knight followed the Hollywood trope of dramatic monsters committing bank robberies, usually for selfish reasons, and the viewers wish to see them get what they deserved in the end. Uh, one more example of this, infidelity. It's often treated the same way as either an act committed by a monster through a dramatic frame or as comedic through a tra tragic comedic framework. 
It isn't difficult to find cultural art artifacts that follow these tried and true recipes. All right, so let's consider the normal prison drama on TV. It features men who are hyperviolent, hardened criminals who will fight for respect and risk their lives to avoid the seemingly inevitable sexual assault that we all know is coming. In TV sitcoms and Hollywood film, Burke's dramatic framing is par for the course. We know some of the men in prisons are good guys, certainly, but most are bad, and we, the viewer, long for them to get what they deserve quite often. Now, per Enkin Morrissey, Orange is the New Black has managed to flip the normal prison as tortured trope on its head by following a naive white woman who practices colorblind politics into the United States prison system. Viewers establish empathy. The white middle class audience, television's norm, identifies with Piper. Unlike the hyper violent characters in Oz and Prison Break, Piper is calm, she's collected, she's friendly, and she doesn't see skin color or so she thinks. Yet she is met with conflict at every turn, and we get it. We know how that would feel because Cohan picked the perfect actress for identification with a white middle-class audience. Viewers empathize. Let's look at how this magic happens. I'm going to show you a few quick scenes from the pilot. Think about target audiences as the white middle-class TV viewer that we've discussed, most of whom have not been to prison. And consider, how can we get them to come with Piper into a scary setting like the prison? By getting them to laugh at her. Yeah. Who's this? My fiance. Yeah? Good luck with that. Excuse me? Any personal items? Here. Any nudie judies in here? Skin pics, naughty stuff? No. No nudie judies. Time to say goodbye. It might be a while that you can visit, fiance. I love you. Please keep my website updated. Lift up your arms. Turn around. Squat. Spread your cheeks and cough. Seriously? Okay, go sit there. She's a nice white lady. Thanks. Thank you, Mommy. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Fred. Who's this? Oh, this is Chapman. She's new. Self-surrender. I think she's fancy. Yogurt. What do I have to do for it? You're a little, you're one of us. Consider it a gift. Thank you. So we can see that Piper's construction as Dreama Moon's good white girl is vital to our ability to ride along with her as viewers. She's a rule follower, mostly like the viewer. She's naive and out of place in prison, like the viewer. And she's spoiled by the luxuries of life, like the viewer, who is actually on Netflix as they're watching. But Enk and Morrissey go further, showing what happens after we decide to ride along with Piper. Piper's comic Fool, who we have empathy for, shows us that colorblind politics is a laughable viewpoint once one is disabused of the illusion of equality provided by privilege. When Piper's privileged identity suddenly come to work against her in the prison setting, it is shocking. And since we are her parasocial friends, we feel bad for her. The viewer relates, but only by accepting the scenario as one that makes sense. And we should take a second to remind ourselves that racism, homophobia, and misogyny do not reside in people. Rather, they're systems of power that individuals can or cannot access based on their identities. We can manipulate the levers and buttons in the pod through performances of gender or race race or class or religion or ableism, but we did not create the pods, nor the system that is operated by the levers within them. We are simply performers in the show, saying or doing things that we have been taught will have a particular effect. The workings of power are naturalized when we don't even notice our lever pulling and button pushing anymore. So Orange is the re New Black 
reveals the pod in all of its nuances. When Piper attempts to pull the levers or push the buttons of white femininity that have always worked for her so well in her life to this point, there are real and often hilarious consequences. The viewer follows along, peering through the Burkean frame of comic tragedy, and we laugh at Piper only because we recognize that colorblind politics are, indeed, an illusion. Viewers can make this acknowledgement without shame because we are laughing along with and at Piper. It's fun. Remember that Burke thinks we should get rid of the dramatic framework altogether, the one that's usually adopted in crime stories, and instead we should begin to think of criminals through the framework of the bumbling clown. And in so doing, what he's saying is that we will replace judgment and retribution with empathy and restoration. Why? Because it, we can't be angry at the buffoon. We can only be angry at monsters. Here's a few scenes that show us Piper's naivety playing out as we laugh along. And in laughing, we realize that her situation only makes sense because race, class, gender, sexuality, able-bodiedness, religion are all real and present identities and that she is manipulating the levers trying to work the system the way that she understands. What the fuck? Friend of yours? No. It's my mom. All right, Chapman, Diaz, this is you. Uh, DeMarco, this is Chapman. She's no. Self surrender, you show a what's what. And a toothbrush. They don't give you one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything. Oh, no, no, it's no problem. We look out for our own. Our own? Oh, don't get LPC on me. It's tribal, not racist. I'll see you around. Excuse me. Hi. I'm Chapman. Yeah, that's me. Mm -hmm. Um, I heard you might have something that I need. Jay Cruz is around the corner. <laughs> yeah. Um, cocoa butter or shea butter? Do you have either of those? Maybe. I would just need an ounce or two. We work on a body system here, you know what that means, right? Yes. Three shower caps or a round brush, whichever they got at commissary. Gladly. I will get them to you the second that my money comes in. Ah! Credit declined. Please. Please, it's for commissary hose and Oliver Twist. So when we watch Orange is the New Black in other similar prison films, according to Ank and Morrissey, two things happen. One, whiteness is recentered as the norm because Piper is our driver. We're riding with Dreamer Moon's good white girl, performer of U.S. white middle class femininity. And two, U.S. white middle class femininity is exposed as both real and as dangerous. Piper's colorblind femininity, which has worked so well for her in the world outside of prison, is laughable when performed in the context of Orange is the New Black. As a viewer, our laughter allows us to admit, without guilt, that race, gender, class, etc. are indeed very real systems, always working and always inescapable. <laughs> 